Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining us again today, everybody. I have a fantastic guest. His name is Ryan McNiff, and he's got a technology platform that is a fall detection and remote monitoring to help loved ones stay in their homes a little longer before they need one-on-one care. So thanks for joining me, Ryan. Thank you so very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Something tells me you've had a, a variety of experiences in your life. So um, I, I, uh, I'm in, up in Boston area, and so I, uh, I help people in senior care. I'm part of uh, a, a company, a private home care company, as well as um, in, involved and invested in nonprofits like the National uh, Aging in Place Council. And at the end of the day, where where our goal is to help people age in place wherever that is. Um, you know, my business does private home care, which means that people are generally trying to age in place at an assisted living or a residential home where they need one-on-one assistance. But through the NAIPC, what we do is we try to do a lot of um, advocacy and education and providing a resource to seniors so that aging in place can be anywhere where they, they rest their head. So whether it's a hospital, a nursing home, doesn't matter to us. We are just happy to try to, wherever but somebody wants to live is where we want to try to provide them the resources and the information to be able to do that successfully. And so um, through the National Aging in Place Council, I met uh, the owners of and founders of Well Aware Care. Um, and as a private agency, and I had, I had uh, uh, met a lot of different remote monitoring, fall detection uh, 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 business owners. It's a very uh, popular field to get into. And these folks really made an impression on me because their big differentiator is that there were no cameras involved and that there was uh, devices all working in the background. So somebody that may have memory care issues or memory impairment isn't expected to interact in any way with these devices to ensure that they are working properly and providing um, the feedback that families need to make sure that their loved one's safe. So anyways, without getting too much into the weeds, I'm sure you have questions about that. That's kind of my background and the kind of the circle of how I started in private home care, started helping people through a nonprofit called the National Aging in Place Council, and then got involved with the, the folks of Well Aware Care in which I became an owner myself. So a kind of a giant circle on how it all worked out. <laughs> Isn't that how most of us do our our careers? Just like they just seem to go in directions we don't generally plan. I do have Absolutely. one quick one quick question on aging in place because I am a very big advocate on, you know, when we get to about eighty five. So I got you know twenty nine more years for that one. Oh man, math on a Monday. I'm doing good. <laughs> it seems like a lot to me. It's logical. To perhaps, and it would be very nice if we had many more options, and I'm sure you would agree, to age in place, but not necessarily in a single family home, because there's there's so much, there's maintenance, there's cooking, there's cleaning, there's, you know, most family, uh, single family homes are not designed to age in place, which is something else that needs to change. My husband's a real estate broker, and it still shocks me to this day that three quarters of single family homes built are two story, at least they are in California. Um, or they're just gigantic. Um, it's just crazy, but I've had multiple experiences in the recent past with people choosing to move into assisted living for one reason or another. And the biggest benefit they found is the ease of which they are able to socialize with other people. So they're not quote isolated in their home. I mean, I am a very big, I work from home. I'm a big homebody. I'm not super social. So it's, I can totally understand why, why you'd want to stay home. But when you add in, you know, it takes more effort to socialize. You got to cook, you got to clean, you got to worry about the the gutters. And, you know, I'm in California. We had to worry about flooding a couple of weeks ago. You know, it's just like, oh yeah, yeah, it's exhausting. And at 85, I don't want to do that crap. At least I don't think I'm going to want to do that. So do you have um, a thought on 
aging in place and social socialization. Cause obviously after the pandemic, we know that that's a very important part of our mental health. Yeah. I mean, with, with socialization, no matter what age bracket, no matter, um, where where you're located it takes initiative on on yourself you have to be willing whether you're in an assisted living you have to be willing to go downstairs to where the activities are are happening if you're in a single family home you have to be willing to go to um the council on aging or go to the the friend in the boston area there are a lot of different um, programs to uh, have seniors socialize and be out but your your point is absolutely valid that if you are looking for um, socialization that's a great place to go because it's people that are um, likely economically in your 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 same wheelhouse as well as in your your age bracket and you don't have to drive somewhere or need to 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 get a a bus to pick you up to drop you off at the senior center you can literally take the elevator down if you're in a wheelchair or whatever it might be and you know that's that's it's a great point you bring up because a lot of people think that private home care is a competitor to assisted living. And sometimes there's an overlap. There's, it would be disingenuous to say that there isn't, but fundamentally private home care allows people to stay at home one-on-one care and assisted living is some assistance, a small amount of help of one-on-one, but allowing you to be in a social environment where there's a lot of activity and room and board are taken care of. Essentially, they're providing two separate services to allow you to age in place in two separate ways. Now, where that overlap can be when families are thinking about, do we need a little bit of private home care or should we just go with an assisted living? But that's really uh, very rare in my opinion, because you know, the amount of private home care that somebody needs, if it's just a little bit to help somebody get up in the in the morning or and then go to bed, I can't provide that service anyways. I can't get caregivers to accept less than six hour shifts. So nobody's going to go out to visit your mom for two hours in the morning and two hours at night anyways. And then the other overlap is that as people age in place and into assisted living, they're going to likely need some type of assistance as they decline and they get older and they need more help. Um, So I think it's a fantastic idea that if a loved one is um, feeling isolated, feels like they're, they're maybe depressed because they don't have friends or family seeing them as often as they like to absolutely explore the options of an assisted living, because that's what it's meant for. It's assisted living was always designed to be able to age with uh, folks that are in your age bracket. And so that you can have an active social life. Makes sense. I just wish we had a little bit more options because to me, well, I've had dogs all my life and I wouldn't necessarily want to have to not have dogs so that I could live in an apartment inside a building. I did I did the dorm life in college. So, you know, like a nice, you know, 800 square foot cottage with maybe a tiny patio yard that I have golden retrievers. So patio yards not probably big enough, but just options like my paternal uh. grandmother. We were talking about her before we started recording she wanted to live at home forever, ended up in board and care for the last nine months of her life. And I found out this past year that she absolutely loved it, which made me want to tear out my hair because she was so adamant against that kind of thought. And I always felt that if there was an option that wasn't an apartment inside a building, and those are most of those apartments are pretty dinky. They're not designed to, you know, spend your whole day inside unless you really like a little cocoon of privacy. (laughs) But my mom was in um, a memory care and attached to an assisted living. And sometimes the gals from the assisted living would go over and do things with the memory care, or they'd bring the less afflicted, less further along memory care residents over and they would do activities with the assisted living community. So it was It had a lot of benefits. I mean, it wasn't just social for some of these people. They also had a purpose, you know, in their 70s and 80s and maybe 90s. So to me, it's just, I think we just need to have a broader broader awareness of what's available. Hopefully we can make more uh, more options available, but just broaden our our thought process. But (laughs) Options are always good. Options are always a good thing to have. That is true. I like options. So tell me more about this well-aware care, this monitoring system, because it, it sounds good. I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people that use cameras um, with their loved ones, maybe in the early to m- early middle stages of Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. And it's been a godsend, but 
I'm not sure that the family members were cognitively aware enough to understand what was going on. And if you, I know like if I had gone to my parents' house and said, I'm going to install these cameras here, my dad would have heaved me out the front door onto the I was going to say there was probably a, a, a cooking pan coming your way uh, yeah. at a high rate of speed if that was the case. Very um, likely. Yeah, and that ends up becoming a major issue, right, is the 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 balancing the need to know what's going on in the home versus the need to keep somebody something private. And so, for example, if you have a if you are 50 years old, right, and you're able bodied and you have dogs at your home, you talked about how you have dogs, right? So maybe you have a camera in your house. And just to make sure when you're away or if you do go out for for a trip that the dogs are okay, it's no big deal because if you happen to walk naked down the hallway, nobody else is looking at your camera but you, right? And so there is still that level of privacy there versus when you are giving somebody access to that camera to be able to check on in on you. There's always that kind of back of your head like, oh, am I being watched at this moment in time? And so you know, what happened with the founders of this company is that their loved one, a, a, a relative of theirs was found, unfortunately, had passed away and was on the ground for um, over a day before they were found and, and realized they had passed. And they said, this is insane. There's got to be a better way. The old cliche, there's got to be a better way. And um, one of them was really good at coming up with great ideas and being a visionary, while the other one had a wealth of background in software development and um, quality um, assurance, meaning that he would go in after software had been developed and he would rip it apart, put it back together and tell you what was wrong with it. And so they do, they made a software. And so what Well Aware Care is, is Fundamentally, we're a hardware integrator. We are a software that allows already existing hardware to plug into our software, talk to us, and then we present that data on a very easy to read dashboard with graphs and infographics and charts and things like that. And so there are two primary uh, pieces of equipment that we use, which is a fall detector and a smart bed pad. And the fall detector is about the size of a round drink coaster. And it is placed up on the wall and it emits radar in a 13 by 13 area. And so it can tell after um, learning the environment through its AI, when somebody comes into the room, it can tell where your sternum is basically. And if you were to drop on the ground, it would perk up figuratively and say, we just recognized a, a fall. And it would give you 60 seconds to get back up. And if after those 60 seconds, you didn't get up, a signal would be sent out to an unlimited amount of contacts. Now those contacts would be added before you install these devices. And it can be your neighbors, it can be your friends, it can be somebody in California, somebody in Boston, somebody in Florida. It can be as many people as you like. And what we've found with falls in both the private home care side of my business and well aware care is the majority of falls are slow falls or they're, they're soft falls on the ground where somebody just needs help getting back up. And what we're providing them is a way to be able to call for help when they're unable to, and for family members and friends and neighbors to know that somebody just needs assistance to get back up in the recliner. And if you get to provide that assistance and it needs an escalation to 911, you're there to be able to, to provide that 911 call. Um, but, you know, what we look at is, is that how are we able to keep people safe in their homes as long as they can if they can afford expensive services like private home care or assisted living services or a nursing home for $15,000 a month. Um, and by no means is this fall prevention, by no means is this um, replacing one-on-one -on -one care, but for those that can't afford it or aren't in a position to hire somebody or don't want to move to the, the assisted living or the board, the, the board in room home that your loved one was so adamant about not going to, this is a low cost option that somebody can have to say, hey, listen, mom, I understand that you want to be independent and you want to stay at home, but I need some reassurance that if something bad happens, I know that uh, I'll be alerted to that uh, immediately. So that is the, the fall detector and where we're trying to help. And what we're trying to do is provide this at a relatively low cost comparatively. I shouldn't say relatively, a low cost compared to where other people are. We're at $50 a month for the service. 
versus needing some of these uh, rather expensive com competitors of ours or private home care or assisted living. Um, so, I mean, there's a, there, what these devices do is they're also kind of multi-pronged. So it's not just fall detection. It's also uh, noticing when somebody's in a room or when they've left a room, how often do they go to the bathroom? What time are they entering the bedroom to go to bed? And what time do they get up in the middle of the night? And what time do they wake up for their day? And where it can help people with memory care issues that somebody's living alone is that you can set alerts to virtually any thing that these detectors pick up. So one of the things we can set alerts for, and we do all the time for, for folks who have memory issues, is that if there's no, if, if the fall detectors don't notice somebody's moving around, well, that's an alert because maybe somebody's walked out the front door. And, you know, so you have these ways to be able to set up um, alerts so that family members can customize it based off of what their their loved ones need. That sounds pretty interesting. And I'm reminded when you said that the founders found a loved one on the floor and they had passed away, my husband's paternal grandmother, um, I think she was trying to get out of a recliner. And when she stood up, the she probably put too much pressure on the front. So she ended up on the floor under the recliner and it took three days before the neighbors kind of was like, wait a minute. We like the newspapers were gathering on the driveway or something. This was in the nineties back when people actually got physical newspapers. Sure. Um, and thankfully the neighbors did see her because I'm not sure she would have survived much past three days. She did. She did survive. The two sons forced her into assisted living, which did not go well. Um, you know, and they, she was probably four ish, maybe five hours away from, both sons, I'd have to I'd have to Google Map to determine, but so she was a long a, way away. That's a perfect example where you know it just just because it goes to your one of your sons, they they like my dad's in Florida, so I mean I can call nine one one from up here, but if if my dad was living alone, I would want his neighbors to have this so that they could take a quick jaunt over there to make sure some somebody was okay. Um, and so where where I got involved with this was because I was seeing private home care costs uh, increase. The minimum hours were increasing. And I was concerned we were pricing ourselves out of the market. And there was a bigger gap of people that needed these services and didn't have any option whatsoever. And so one of the things that happens with us in the private home care side of our business is that um, we are a crisis business. When somebody has an, a major issue, a major fall, a contusion, a broken hip, a broken arm, that's when they find out about private home care. And about 10 seconds later, they start calling up private home care companies to then 10 seconds later, give a credit card to hire private home. So you're talking the, the length of of finding out about this, knowing you need it, and then paying for thousands of dollars can be as quick as 30 seconds. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't take very long. And so one of the things we talk about with family members is that, and, and I don't know if you've had this experience, is that they really have no idea what's going on inside the home. They have no idea. And their parents don't tell them. And my dad doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> if he, I'll talk to an aunt and an uncle and they'll be like, your dad, my dad was sick with COVID and didn't tell me until after he got better. So, oh, I mean, wow. this is not uncommon for people in the industry and outside of the industry. So if you're listening to this, don't feel bad. But what this can do, what this 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 program can do this service can do for um you know 50 bucks a month is provide you a real 360 view of exactly what's going on in the home that when you talk to somebody's pcp or your parents pcp or whatever professionals you rely on to work with your older adult and your older loved one in your lives you actually have some knowledge of what's going on how often is dad going to the bathroom I have no idea. Well, you would now because you can see that he's been going the bathroom on average eight times a day, but now he's going 22 times a day. So is that a medication issue? Is that a UTI problem? Is there an, an issue there? Well, that's a red flag. We need to get you into a doctor, dad. And so, you know, the other, the other piece of device that we have is a smart bed pad that goes under the, the, the bed. Um, excuse me, the mattress, and it goes in between the mattress and the, the box spring. And that can uh, learn your... Uh, your resting heart rate, your respiration, um, the quality of your sleep, when you actually fall asleep, when you actually wake up. And we can set it to smart devices so that if you wake up in the middle of the night, it will automatically illuminate the, 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 the path to the bathroom. What we are finding is that the most 
falls are occurring in the threshold into the bathroom. That is where we, our customers are finding, uh, we are finding most of our customers are falling. And so we have these families, we have about uh, close to a hundred clients now that use us for this, that these family members are so relieved that they know that their parents aren't going to be stranded on the ground for five hours or three days, or they have an idea of what's going on in the home, even though they live in California and their parents live down in Arizona where they retired. And so there's finally this kind of um, the fog of war, if you will, is kind of lifted. And they're like, hey, I can actually talk with my parents' doctor about what's going on, what I'm concerned about, and what we're seeing without the use of any cameras, without the use of any wearables, without a senior needing to press buttons. So if your loved one has memory issues, the great thing about those pendants is they get to walk outside and they can they can go anywhere with them. The bad thing is you got to put them on and then you got to use them and then you got to want to use them. I mean, we have people come up to us at trade shows that are like, my dad has no memory issues. He is poor mobility and he will fall on the ground and then refuse to press his pendant because he doesn't want three fire trucks showing up and he just would rather wait four hours on the floor until I realize he's on the floor and then I have to go over and pick him up. And so, you know, these family members are, are going nuts trying to do the right thing. Um, but there's, that's not always as easy. That's easier said than done sometimes. Oh, that's for sure. So my mom at the end of her life in the memory care had an unobserved fall that um, they don't know what happened. She was fully mobile, did not need any mobility aids. And they're not even sure what she hit. She needed stitches over her eye. I mean, it was just baffling. I now suspect that it was a sign of her mind forgetting to forgetting how to walk or like for how her brain, how to communicate to walk. That's not very good grammar, but I think you guys get the point. And... Um, cause she fell twice. The second, um, the third, well, she technically fell three times. The third time she was grappling with the, um, care staff who, the more help she needed, the less willing she was to accept it. And she was getting very feisty and they had her out of the shower and she angrily reached for her clothes and slipped and broke her leg. That was March 8th, 2020. And she passed away March 31st. So that was, that was a fun month, but thankfully I didn't have to deal with all the COVID insanity. I dealt with it a little bit, yeah. um, but I, I didn't have to, there were, there were a lot of hard decisions that would have had to have been made and, and a lot of stress. And so I got to avoid that. So that was great, but it would have been nice because her room was small enough. She would have only needed one of those devices because and which everybody probably would have appreciated um, because they they found her early in the morning, but they don't know when she fell. Um, but cameras were not allowed in her room in the memory care, which was a little bit frustrating. But, you know, I I could see both sides. And, you know, she and another um, resident like to get into a little bit of mischief. <laughs> and so it would have been kind of nice to know what was going on just from a just like a just a need to know kind of thing. So. Um, so you so you bring up a couple of really great examples of of where well aware care helps. Um, mostly, what we've been talking about is in a residential home, or I imagine people are envisioning in a residential home. We're actually quite popular in assisted livings, memory care, and traditional. So we had we had a customer, and unfortunately, this customer has since passed away. But she had dementia, and she was. Um, living in the, the dementia side of the memory care side of the assisted living, but um, she would fall. And when you're at least in Massachusetts, I don't want to speak too broadly, but in general, you know, an assisted living is only going to help you for a few hours of day, maybe one hour in the morning, one hour at night, and then they'll come and get you when it's mealtime. And in between those mealtimes, if your door is shut, they're not really checking in on you too often, if at all. And so her issue was her mom would fall and she would be on the ground for two or three hours until it was mealtime. And those were perfect examples. And what she was finding out about her mom, bringing up the point of, of, of that catastrophic fall that, um, you know, basically led to, to your loved ones 
passing away, is that we're finding that uh, that falls don't just happen out of the blue like that, these catastrophic falls. There's a lead up to them. And so these fall detectors in the dashboard you log into to see what's going on in your, your parents' home, um, it will record, but no, won't alert people, but it will record um, recovered falls where somebody falls and then they get up on their own. And what we find is that somebody starts having those recovered falls more and more often and then you have the big one, almost like the volcano that's kind of rumbling, right? And saying, hey, listen, th- we're going to explode soon. So you better get the heck away from me. And then, boom, the eruption occurs. And so family members are going to be able to be proactive in that scenario to be able to say, hey, listen, we're seeing that mom is starting to fall more. We need to figure out a solution before these little minor falls become a major fall. And so, we're actually in an uh, assisted living right now, helping a family do that. They were paying for overnight care, one-on-one care, um, because their loved one would wake up in the middle of the night and then rush to go to the bathroom and fall. And since they were memory care, they didn't remember to pull the the cord or to let anybody know because they didn't know they had dementia. They just knew they had to pay. And so they were paying an agency $35, $40 an hour to just sit there for the one to two times a night that she woke up so that she wouldn't fall. So what we did was we put that that smart bed pad under her mattress and we connected it to the on-call desk. So whenever that person, the second that person, that resident gets out of bed, the phone rings because it's a, a text, a phone call, and an email that automatically goes out because we can set it to you know, let us know five minutes after they get up out of bed or one second after they get out of bed. We can track it for any way, set alarms for anything you like. So. The second she gets out of bed, the phone rings. The people know what the phone's for. They run into her room as she's getting out of bed, and then they help her to the bathroom and help her get back. So right there, we help somebody age in place where they want to be, which is a memory care unit. We've saved that family literally thousands of dollars a month in paying for an expensive one-on-one care. And we've helped that assisted living keep a valuable resident in their their assisted living that they don't want to have to send to a nursing home because the family doesn't want that. The resident doesn't want that. And the assisted living doesn't want it. And so that's a perfect example of what you're bringing up when somebody is having issues in a, in assisted living or in a small condo to be able to utilize well aware care and be able to age in place where they want to age safely for a relatively minimal cost. When you're already paying seven or $8,000 a month for memory care, 50 bucks a month is not a lot to spend for those, for those that are out there that haven't gotten into this world, it's not cheap and it gets expensive extraordinarily quickly. And so I I know, I know Jennifer, you, you understand how 50 bucks a month isn't a lot when you're paying $8,000 a month for, for memory care. And that was what that family was facing because what we, in our industry, it's called a spend down. So you have X amount of dollars in the bank and it's how quickly you spend that down. And so if you're spending $8,000 a month for memory care, all right, maybe you can make it three years. Let's say, let's say you got a lot of money, you can make it three years. But if you're spending $8,000 a month and then you're spending, let's say another $10,000 a month in private one-on-one care, well, you've just cut your time in more than half on where your spend down is. And that's where that snowball gets moving real fast down the hill. And it's it's really tough to, to slow it down in, in this analogy, the spending is the snowball. And so if we can help families save some money while keeping them at home, I think that's a win-win. And that's where we're really excited about trying to help people. And that's why I've been active with the NAIPC and, and, and really encourage people to to uh, work with their local chapters and finding good resources for their loved ones. Well, having been a child of the eighties. So when I was in high school is when the desktop computers first started coming out. I'm going to really age myself now. It's a good thing. I tell everybody how old I am. <laughs> um, it, I'm seeing how, if you want to, well, if you want to age well, you really almost need an overlap of, technology, AI type devices, like what we're talking about now, and like people, your neighbors, your family to kind of, well, obviously you still need them. If the device says, Hey, Jennifer just fell over the dog and hasn't gotten up versus the one time I did trip over the dog and fell on top of him. (laughs) Um, you know, see, I just see like an overlap. It's like 
We want to age in place as long as possible. Even if our loved one's got a cognitive disease, my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. Obviously the last three years she was in memory care prior to that, you know, my dad was taking care of her, but I, I'm convinced that taking care of her shortened his life because he had his chronic, his chronic illnesses. He didn't accept help from my sister and I, um, Neither one of them were easy to live with, so the two, they would fight a lot. So he would, he was not very patient with her repetitive questions and that kind of thing, which is very difficult. And he didn't, he didn't research like education as the way I did to learn more about the disease and everything. On like, well, when your mother asks you the same dang question every two minutes and you've run out of answers thirty minutes into your visit, now what? That's that's where I started the podcast. Yeah. But, you know, I, I see a definite overlap in utilizing technology to stay at home longer. And, you know, obviously, like, my neighbors are really good. We were um, out of town. And, of course, everything that had been ordered came the day we left and, like, a couple days after. And, as we mentioned, it was pouring. So it's like, could you please fetch the stuff off the porch and stick it in the garage? <laughs> because I don't really want these boxes outside for 10 days getting drowned in the rain. <laughs> Yeah, no, but you're absolutely right. And and what we found is that um, with COVID going on, we weren't really successful in, in especially with assisted livings, because they were just trying to keep their head above water. No pun intended with what you just went through, but they were, they were struggling to, because they had so many deaths, they had just so many expenses. I mean, they couldn't think two days ahead of time, let alone six months or a year to talk about a program by well aware care. But what we have found over the last four or five months is things have really opened up and we've gotten back to what we call this new normal, where we just kind of live with COVID, but it's always a threat, but we're just kind of moving forward is, um, the staffing crunch of not having enough caregivers and aides has really allowed um, us to be able to take advantage of that saying, Hey, listen, you know, if you, you need to, everybody is everybody out there from home care to hospitals. I mean, maybe not hospitals because they're, they're made more advanced, but from home cares to, to assisted livings, independent livings, they're all looking at technology and trying to figure out how that's going to be utilized. It's, it's very not similar, but it's somewhat an example of kind of how we've seen fast food companies over the last decade, figure out how to bring AI and automation and, and, and automated kiosks into their fast food restaurants to, because they can't find the people or they don't want to pay the people or whatever reason it is, they don't want the overhead of staff. And so the, the staff isn't going to go away. That's always going to be needed in senior care. Uh, there are no robots magically showing up in the next year or two or quite frankly, 10 years that are going to be able to completely replace an aid. But we, what, what facilities and communities are looking at is how they can supplement um, uh, uh, technology to be able to fill in those gaps where there just isn't enough staffing. There aren't enough people. Right now, in most assisted livings and nursing homes in this country, they are woefully, un- inadequately um, staffed to the point where the governments are turning a blind eye because it's the safety in numbers. You can't get everybody in trouble when everybody is dealing with the same issue. It's like, hey, listen, what are you going to do to me? Because you're going to have to do it to the other 2,000 sniffs in this this area because they they're all failing to hit that um, staffing ratio. So if they're having problems, assisted livings are having problems, home care is having problems. Well, there is an opportunity there to fill that in with some hopefully, uh, you know, relatively inexpensive um, uh, options when it comes to technology. Um, and, And you're without a doubt. Now, to your point of the neighbors, the neighbors are calling, though. They're calling like every once in a while. Hey, it's four o'clock on Thursday. Are you okay? Uh, I haven't seen you in two days. Are you okay? Well, I mean, that's better than nothing, but I'd rather know that my dad's on the ground 30 seconds after they've fallen rather than a neighbor finding out, you know, 48 hours after they've fallen. And that's where we're hoping to be able to help families out. Well, it just seems that people are a little bit more willing to utilize technology before they consider moving into any type of care community, assisted living, memory care, whatever. You know, we, I'm trying to change the narrative that, you know, we need to think about assisted living as a place that allows us to do what we want in our advanced years, you know, 85, 90 years old, 
You know, like, I like to cook, I like to bake, but I don't know that I'm going to want to be doing that in 30 years. Maybe, oh knows. And maybe I would want to do a little bit, but where my mom lived, the food was great. It was really good. So... And I'm not against all of that. I mean, the only thing I've ever said when somebody's sitting there going, I don't know whether to get private home care or an assisted living. I, I say, I know this is going to sound biased, but get the private home care first. And here's why. You can fire us a heck of a lot easier and move into an assisted living. Then you can move into an assisted living, sell the house to pay for the assisted living, find out your loved one doesn't like it there. And then you're really in trouble because you're not going to be able to buy the condo back or the house back for what what you 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 sold it for or what you paid it for at 30 40 years ago yeah. and you know you can always get rid of me and you just call me up and say you know what we're not going to do private home care we're going to go to the assisted living now and we're out of there within you know 15 minutes you can't do it that easily with the other way around but um you know there is I would say there's a lot of saturation in, in Boston area for assisted livings. I, they're kind of getting like Dunkin' Donuts, Jennifer. They're like on every corner. Um, they're Dunkin' now. They're not Dunkin' Donuts. God forbid. Oh. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wonder, I do wonder when that saturation point is. And, uh, and I'm not sure we've hit it yet. And those are for, I guess, people that get paid a lot more than we do. But um, I don't know when that is. But it feels like there's a lot of them out there already. That's interesting because, well, I moved from the San Francisco Bay Area, the suburbs, and they had just built, they opened a new uh, community, memory care slash assisted living. It opened the month we moved, which was December of 21. But that was the first one in a long time. Um, oh, we're know, opening them up left and right over here. Yeah, well, and I live now, so I live an hour north of sacramento so technically i guess in the sacramento suburbs um so that sounds weird i lived in the same county for 55 years we still refer to it as home it's kind of funny um where i live i don't see any of them but i'm kind of in an insulated community it's interesting i'm gonna have to drive around a little bit more probably in the towns around us this isn't a very populous town um, but we're also a little bit more rural where people have less money. So that probably plays a factor in, in, in those decisions as well. And I liked your advice about hiring private home care first, because I think there's almost going to have to be stages. It's like, okay, you know, mom and dad are getting older. Like our daughter is two hours away. You know, she might feel more comfortable, say, hopefully in 10 years when we're in our mid sixties with this kind of technology in 10 years, God knows what we'll have. Ooh, that's kind of a, that's a whole mind thought right there. And then maybe, Hey mom, let me have somebody come in and do X, Y, Z. And then you, you know, it's like step kind of like the reverse stages of childhood. You know, you need all this care at the beginning, then less and less and less. And you move into a dorm generally, maybe in the military, you know, maybe you move into an apartment with four other people and you're, you're mostly on your own, but you know you got mom and dad kind of there to backstop in an emergency. And then then you've launched and you're on your own and come what may, you, you deal with it. And I almost feel like we need to do the same thing in reverse as we age. And I don't think, I think it's becoming more of a topic like we're talking about. I don't think people really think about that. They just feel like, hey, I worked my buns off to get this house, you know, especially in Boston or where I'm at in California. Nothing's cheap in California. You, know, you work really hard to get a home. You don't want to just sell it and move into some dinky little apartment inside a building with a bunch of other old people. That does that doesn't sound appealing, really. So it'd be I think I think the more technology we have, the longer people will be able to age in their homes with less negative issues. Now we're gonna take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. 
I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, so I mean, you, 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 you keep teeing this up for me pretty much, Jennifer. <laughs> um, thank you. So, the, so the, you were talking about that, that, that kind of process, that roadmap of what happens and when it happens. And so that, that is the crux of what we're trying to get to with Well Aware Care is that, you know, really at 65 years of age, and this is more of studies talking, this isn't you personally or anybody listening, but at 65 years of age is when, when that kind of threshold happens where people really become fall risks. Now, of course, you're going to have anomalies of people that are, can do jumping jacks till they're 85 years old, and they're going to be people that are fall risks at 55 years old. But the, the, that number is really where it is. And in a perfect world, we would be able to have devices like Well Aware Care in people's homes, especially if they're living alone, to be able to start seeing what's going on. So you're, the, the, the idea is being proactive is what you're talking about in the sense of, hey, listen, we're starting to see this aging decline based off of Well Aware Care and the reports it's running and sending us and what we're seeing. And we need to start making a decision about what we're going to do, whether we're going to go down the assisted living road, whether we're going to go age in place, whether we're going to go private home care. Now, just because somebody starts falling doesn't mean it's, this isn't a, a commercial for minute women. This isn't, you have to get private home care. The reason somebody might be falling is because there are throw rugs on the ground that you need to pick up and get rid of. It could be the damn cat that just keeps tripping and going over and nestling on your, your, your ankles to, uh, I don't know what it's called, purring or whatever it is. And they, you trip over it. It could be that you just need to install grab bars into the home. You might have to change the lighting of the home and make it a bit more bright because because somebody's not seeing the lip of the one step or two step from the living room up into the kitchen. There are a lot of reasons and medications are another big one that can cause a fall to happen that it don't mean that you need to run out and buy an assisted living or private home care. It might mean you just need to get a carpenter in there to spend 500 bucks to put some grab bars in there. And I promise you that $500 will look like pennies if your loved one trips, falls, and breaks their hip and goes to a hospital. And a, and a side note, if you break your hip and you're over 65 years of age, you got about 16 months left to live. That's what the statistics are showing. That's how deadly a, a broken hip is in older age. And so the idea is, is that people can be proactive about this and ideally avoid the broken hip because what we're talking about is somebody calls me up because they were like, I didn't realize mom was such a bad fall risk until she broke her hip. I know I saw the contusion on her head, but she said she just bumped her head into the cabinet or whatever. Well, that wasn't a bump into the cabinet. That was a fall. And so if we're able to show families um, what's going on in the home, they can then be empowered to make a decision on how they can help their loved ones age in place, wherever that is, as safely as possible. Going back to your point, then maybe you go into the assisted living with all the, what did you call them crusty old people or something like that, <laughs> where, where you're not allowed to bake, but you get to eat a lot of food. Or maybe it's independent living. Maybe you go to a CCRC where you start out independently and then you can move to an assisted living, then you can move to a nursing home. Or maybe you go age in place and you get a ramp and you modify your home so that you go from a two-story, which you talked about to a one story, right? And then you make that, that the living room that nobody uses because it's a formal living room, you turn that into the bedroom. And then all of a sudden you're living on one floor, which reduces that risk of a fall because you were finding that the falls were happening while you were going up and down the stairs. And so the, the idea is knowledge is power. And if you're able to have knowledge and understanding of what's going on, you're going to be able to be far more, more proactive. And, and that's where I think you're 
your heart's in it, Jennifer, and why you're this labor of love of what you're doing with a, a podcast is you're trying to convince people to be proactive. Hey, be aware of what's going on. You, I made mistakes with my loved ones. I wish I, I learned things we, we, we learn, but you don't get to really go back and change them. And you're doing a podcast to help people, um, avoid the pitfalls and the mistakes that many of us have made with our older loved ones based off of the knowledge that you have. You're trying to pass that forward and, and pay that forward, which is outstanding. And we're hoping to be able to do that in our way um, to be able to help families make that, that, that decision, because it's really tough. It's tough to say, mom and dad, we need to take the keys away or mom and dad, we got to put you into a nursing home or an assisted living because you're sitting there going like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the right decision is. You know, mom's adamant that she's okay. She is so adamant. I've never seen her so angry. She whipped (laughs) that frying pan at me so hard, (laughs) you know, but if you have definitive data that says, Hey, mom has fallen seven times in the last two months and three of them, she couldn't get up on her own and she needed help for it. You know, there's a problem and it makes that decision easier for adult children to, to, take the step forward, put their foot down and say, Hey, listen, we need to have this tough conversation. And I really think that families just need that information to be able to make the decisions because it's so difficult to put your foot down when you're unsure of what's going on. Yeah. And it's hard as an adult child, when you're trying to take care of a parent, because like there was things people would say, you know, when your mom asked the same question over and over again, just make stuff up. Well, that always felt bad. So it's, you know, you still have that, this is my mother, I respect her, you know, God forbid I lie to her or, you know, when we, when, after my dad passed away and I knew that her living with me was not a good idea, that, she, you know, the best place for her was memory care. She literally had a moment of clarity and she said, you're not selling my house. And I said, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And she whipped her head over and looked at me and she says, and you're not renting it out either. And I thought, oh, <laughs> it's like, oops, busted. And, you know, I don't remember what I said, but it was not a pleasant day at all because she had an inkling of what was going on and she was not, she was in the more advanced stages of Alzheimer's. But I kind of want to leave because we were talking about, you know, knowledge is power. One thing that people don't seem to understand or they, they kind of duck around this is 70% of us are going to need care before we die. And we just need to plan that we're in that 70% because I have not seen a breakdown of what the other 30% are, you know, like my paternal grandmother lived to, well, she needed care because she couldn't see, but so that's not a very good example. But, you know, my, her husband, my paternal grandfather died suddenly of a heart attack. So he didn't need care because he died, you know? So it's like people die of other things. You know, maybe it was COVID, maybe it was a car accident, maybe it was a sudden heart attack. We don't really know what that 30% is. So I'm my other soapbox that I like to stand on is just assume you're in the 70% because, you know, 70% is a much bigger number than 30. Even I can do that math. And, you know, then it makes it a little bit easier to say, okay, I think we're getting to the point in mom's life or, you know, maybe even will this product work with two people living at home? Okay. So it will it will it will work with two people living at home. It just won't be able to distinguish who's who, right? So so it will know that somebody fell. It just won't know which of those somebody's fell, and it will send that alert out. And it, it certainly will. It doesn't just need to be a fall. If you have a stro- any stroke, heart attack, a UTI, any reason you go from standing to on the ground, it's going to pick that up and be able to send that alert out. And your your point is absolutely. Correct. Uh, And it's one of the things whenever I go on a podcast, I have no affiliation with these folks, but go to fivewishes.org. It is a, um, it is a, uh, a planning website that it's a nonprofit that helps you with, with advanced, uh, advanced planning and and advanced directives. And so my opinion and, and, and jumping on your soapbox as well, Jennifer, (laughs) is that for many years, you know, your parents didn't plan, I assume, or many parents didn't plan. Um, and, and so it is, it is on us right now, if you, are, if you are 50, 55 plus years old, to plan. And planning doesn't have to be that crazy. It's, it's, it's downloading your healthcare proxy. It's going through your advanced directives. What happens if you can't speak for yourself because you're in a coma? You have a heart attack and you're alive. 
but you're not able to communicate and picking somebody in your family or somebody in your circle of trust of friends and loved ones that can make some of those decisions on you for, for uh, what's right for your situation. And if you are able to do some very basic planning going through again to the, a website like five wishes, you are going to be able to save. It is not, it is not for you. It is for, for the peace of mind of your loved ones, because I cannot tell you, and I am not joking how many homes I've been in or how many caregivers have told me they've been in a home where as somebody is actively dying, family members are fighting, family members are yelling and screaming, not, not in the days, not in, I'm talking as somebody is taking their last breaths in the other room, family members are duking it out over whatever reason, because one said that this wasn't the way it should have gone while this one said it was, and they never, and you, and then it just, it dissolves very quickly. Family dynamics are difficult. And what you are doing is you are not giving yourself just a gift, but you are giving your children the gift of being able to make these decisions guilt-free without having to worry about, did they do the right thing under the right circumstances? And they sit there and they're worried and they're stressed and they wake up at night for months and years afterwards, worried if they did the right thing by you. You are giving them the gift of being able to sleep at night, knowing that, hey, I had a heart attack. I wasn't able to speak for myself. My family said that I was never going to recover to a point where I wouldn't be bedridden and I wouldn't have communication issues. And I want you to pull the plug at that point in time. It is not worth keeping me alive. Or it is. You know, whatever those wishes are, you are able to pass that along to your loved ones so that they don't have to try to think about what the right thing to do is. And you don't have a bunch of infighting within your family on what the right thing to do is because you've set those parameters up beforehand. I cannot highly recommend it. Just do those very simple things. You know, if you want to take a step further, get your trust and your wills together and your estate together, but being able to do your advanced directives and having a healthcare proxy is probably like 65, maybe even 70% of the battle. Yeah, I agree with that. We did our, our estate trust planning in 2020 um, a lot of listeners know we had a couple of tough questions. My daughter has an autoimmune disease. She's our only child. And not on top of the, if you develop Alzheimer's situations that we had to discuss with the attorney, he also said, well, what happens if she goes first? I was like, uh, that's a terrible question. But once I had gotten out of my head and made the decision, you know, she was engaged at the time. Now they're married. It's amazing how like her husband, Grew up very poor. He's got some family members that are a little sketchy. I mean, his parents are great. Couple sisters are great. Um, there's five of them and two thirds of, of the siblings are okay. Um, but money changes people. And I thought, well, if we give him the money and then his siblings start doing some nefarious stuff. And the next thing you know, you're like mind tripping over stupid things that'll probably never happen. And I just, one day I just said, you know what? I'll be dead. I won't care. <laughs> it's just like, Bam. End of mind trip. Yeah, you can't rule from the grave, right? right? And and I think those that try to do that, you know, they cause more angst and problems than than if 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 you want somebody to get money, make sure it's in the well. If you don't want somebody to make make sure it's in the well. And but you can't force somebody to do something after the fact like you're talking about or try to play 3D chess or whatever and 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 make sure that it's just, you know, and if, if you're that concerned with family members and give your money to the Red Cross or something, I don't know, a good charitable foundation. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, it can get complicated and it certainly is emotional when you're going through your advanced directives and, and you, it sounds like you had a great lawyer and a estate planner to bring up some things that maybe you and I wouldn't have thought about, you know, Hey, who's the backup to the, to the main person, right? Who's the pinch hitter if, if they go down. Um, but, you know, those are the important questions that need to be answered because, you know, there's there, you talk to any doctor or you talk to any any of these professionals and they'll have a laundry list of stories of where, you know, things that you never thought were going to happen. They magically there's 350 million people in this country. It's if, if you can think it up, it's going to happen at some point in time. So you might as well think of those contingencies and plan for them. And and like you said, assume you're going to be that 70 percent that's going to need care. Um, assume you're going to be that whatever percentage that's going to be in a coma and can't talk for themselves, assume that. And then when you don't need it, well, then the paper just gets thrown out when, when you go eventually anyway. So, I mean, that, that nobody's going to be upset with your preparation. People would be upset with your lack of preparation. 
Oh, yeah. I lived that one because my dad never never talked to anybody about what would happen with my mother if he died first. I found out from his friend he assumed she'd come live with me. And while he was in the hospital, I became painfully aware of the horrific situation that would have been. She would have been unhappy. I would have been unhappy. She had a dog that was overly spoiled. Golden retrievers love everybody, maybe except squirrels. Um, my dogs hated her dog. So it just, it like wasn't even an option. We were still working. I mean, we still are now, but it was like, I would have had to hire a caregiver to deal with her during the day so we could do what we needed to do. I'm like, this, this is not a situation that should have just been dumped on me. So <sighs> thankfully she had, their home was paid for. And as I mentioned before, we rented it out for three years and, you know, we got a little bit blessed. We sold their home during COVID. <laughs> so we got a ridiculous amount of money for it. <laughs> and uh, we have a family friend that lives around. The, his He takes his grandkids to school, which is across the street. And he sent me a picture because my dad's prized, beautiful front yard was all ripped up. Now, my parents had a very large yard with an immense amount of grass. I'm sh and I know from when the renters were there, that water bill was not pretty. And so, you know, having lived for two or three years in, quote, extreme drought, yeah, grass is gone. <laughs> so <laughs> we were just discussing that. I'm like, maybe I'm going to have to drive by and see what they've done with this yard. My dad's probably, you know, dying all over again because <laughs> he was meticulous about his yard. He kept the landscapers on their toes, but, you know. Their house. Well, just to be clear, well aware care can't do anything for landscaping. We <laughs> can't tell true. you if the grass is overgrown or if it's green or if it's brown, but we can do a lot, but we can't do that. <laughs> it's unfortunate. Maybe one day I'll talk to the the, yeah. the founders of the company. Maybe they'll they'll come up with something. <laughs> oh, there's there's probably some sensor for the yards too. They're just not necessarily an aging in place piece of tech. But yeah, well, you know, when yeah. I was in high school, they were like four day work weeks, which they're threatening as might actually happen 2023. So 39 years after graduating from high school, that might actually happen. Um, so maybe the high tech homes that they envisioned, you know, 40, I was going to say 30 years ago, but that was the 90s. So 40 or 50 years ago, maybe that, well, the Jetsons homes are actually kind of becoming a thing with um, telehealth. There's there's a little meme going around with four panels of the Jetsons, and it's and basically it's pretty much our reality these days. I'm just waiting for the Auto Chef, where you you program what you want to eat and it pops out. That's that's what I'm waiting for. One day, one day we'll <laughs> all have our own robot chef that makes three <laughs> three Michelin star uh, food for us every single night. That would be a good thing to have, right? Yeah, because, you know, even with just two of us, it's amazing how dinner becomes a complicated situation frequently, at least in my house. I don't know. We're pretty good at planning and then plans go out the window because, you know, my husband's in real estate. That's always a whole gamble of what if you're going to get your stuff done today or 15 situations are going to happen. So, you know, but it's I was going to ask one last question, then I'll let you sure. go. So when we moved, we really didn't want a two story house. Most of the square footage is upstairs. It's the my office and the guest room and a full bath downstairs. So if I have a 2,000 square foot home with two walls, three walls, essentially, how many of these devices would I want? So the devices, that's a, that's a great question. A lot of people ask us about that. So the device covers a 13 by 13 area. So, so 13 by 13, for people that are listening, 13 times 13 is a 169. So if you take the square footage of your house and you divide it by 169, you will get an idea of how many dev devices you would need to cover every inch of your home. So your home being 2,000 square feet, roughly, would it be about 12 devices. Um, but not everybody needs to buy 12 devices, not but everybody does. So there are going to be some rooms that if you move to the first floor and you don't use the upstairs very much, well, then I would recommend not to cover the upstairs. Um, and so, you know, additionally, that doesn't include the furniture. That doesn't include where you're going to put these fall detectors in the most advantageous spots where somebody's walking 90% of the time. So the example I, I give is if you walk into an assisted living, well, the person, when you're in the hallway, right, you go down the hallway and there's usually a, a bathroom to your right or to your left, and then you walk into a, a living room slash bedroom area. Well, most of the time people aren't 
walking on the other side of the bed. They're walking on the side of the bed that they sleep on that, that is closest to the door and closest to the bathroom. So when they get up in the morning, they walk less. So do you really need a fall detector on that other side of the bed that somebody's not on? Probably not. So based off of people's homes, they're going to have to look at What are the rooms that people are spending the most amount of time in? What are the rooms that people are spending the least? And then do you want to save some money and, and, and not protect those rooms? So if there is a fall in that room, then, uh, then it obviously wouldn't be, um, alerted to it. But, um, funny, you should bring up this, this situation is that we had a, uh, a person in an independent, we still have them in an independent living. Um, and they were adamant that mom does not go into this room. Mom does not go into this room. Guess where mom was going into <laughs> the room. And so mom fell. And all of a sudden we started picking up that uh, there was something on the ground. But since the fall detector didn't see the fall, it didn't alert to a fall. So what we, we, we created was that in a, a special alert that if somebody falls in another room, but then crawls into an area or an arena that is being detected by these falls, it's going to pick this weird thing up and say, well, something really big's on the ground. This is kind of strange. Let's send Jennifer an alert and it won't be a fall alert, but it will be like a concern, like something's going on. Let's go check on it. And if it's in an assisted living, then you can easily call the front desk and somebody can be there in 30 seconds. And uh, we, we've had this happen before in assisted livings where somebody falls, they hit their head badly. And there was literally a pull cord right next to them where they fell. But they were so discombobulated, they were crawling to try to get to the, the door to get out or maybe to the, the, the telephone. And our fall detectors picked it up and 911 was there in like seven and a half minutes. So um, there are a number of fall detectors to answer your question. Uh, if depending on the size of your home, you might need more depending on how small the home is. We find that an assisted living room, uh, assisted living one bedroom room needs about two to three fall detectors, one for the bathroom, one for the hallway, one for the main living area slash bedroom area. Um, and so that can kind of give you an idea of what's needed plus the, the sleep pad. That's awesome. Well, it's definitely something we're going to need more of because, like you said, we we had a significant caregiver shortage before COVID, and now it's just exasperated beyond absolutely all 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 imaginable ways. And yeah, like and I so said, I mean, it's 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 one of those things where there's going to be technology that that infiltrates us. Somebody is going to to fix this. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of who's going to be able to do that. Um, one note, there are a lot of companies out there that do this. Um, one distinction to know is that a lot of those companies are fall deduction companies. So one of the, it's, it's, I get fascinated by it. It's so interesting to me, but these fall deduction companies, what they do is they do it a little bit differently where they have devices that learn your habits. It's like when you get up in the morning, when you go to bed, all these different things. And if you deviate from those habits, then they will send alerts out based off of that. Um, There are pros and cons to both of them. We look at it as we really want to know when there's a fall. And when there is a fall, we want to send that alert out immediately. Well, with deduction companies, there can be more false alerts. Because if you just happen to decide to sleep in an extra hour, they might say, hey, there's a problem going on. but at the same time, there are some pros to having that. But we look at it as if there's a fall, we want to make sure we are right far, far more often than we're wrong. And uh, I won't say that we're perfect. There can be mistakes made in, in, in technology and false alerts that go out. But um, we find that that's pretty minimal. And, and when a fall occurs, it's, it's something to be concerned about. And, and the alert goes out and, and families are thrilled about it. Yeah, a false alert would be a lot better than no alert. Yeah, yeah. Until until you hit that kind of threshold of like the boy that cried wolf, right? Um, and then all of a sudden it becomes an issue where there's so many false alerts that that the the real one sneaks by and and it becomes you know it becomes as 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 worthless as if not you didn't have it in the first place. So you're right, the the uh, false alerts, but you know it, there's a there's a there's a uh, kind of uh, a threshold there until it becomes more annoying and, and all of a sudden it kind of 
uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of having the detectors in there in the first place. Well, nothing's perfect, but the more options we have, the better we can age well and live to 103 like my paternal grandmother and my plan. Hey, that's the plan, right? Yeah. That's the plan. <laughs> hey, I got a lot of things I still want to do and, you know, I guess I'm going to need those 46, 47 years to do them. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's no doubt you'll be able to do that. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you having me on and I appreciate you having a podcast that's there to educate people and, and help people navigate these waters because it can feel like you're alone a lot. And, uh, it's definitely good to have these resources out there. Uh, definitely. Well, I appreciate you coming on and where can people find you? So you said there's five wishes. Is that spelled out or the number five? I know that's if you not type you. in five wishes to Google, it will come up. It's a nonprofit that helps with that, that um, advanced directives and, and, and healthcare proxies. And if you want to learn more about WellAware Care, if you just go to Google and type in WellAware Care, we'll come right up and you can learn more. And there will be a, a phone number and a website that you can contact us. We can go anywhere in the country. It's not just Boston. We can configure these and drop ship them wherever you need. And and these fall detectors stick on the wall with uh, the command strip. So, um, you know, pretty easy to install plug and play technology that that works um, impressively and you'll you'll be glad you have it. Awesome. Well, those will both be linked in the show notes as usual. And I appreciate you coming on today. And thank you very much. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>